Okay, so does anybody know what kind of image this is we're looking at? Anybody know what this particular artistic motif is called? Well, what do we have here? All right, you have a skull sitting in between a flower and an hourglass. What would you argue would be the purpose of this? What is, it, what is this picture trying to convey? The afterlife. Why would you say afterlife? Because I guess while you're living, um, I guess that's what the flower would represent. And then like, uh -huh. when I'm going down like, a certain, like the thing would be, it's like only a certain amount of time to actually do what your life is, maybe? Okay, yeah, so yeah, we have um, a representation of life on one side, time on the other, and death in the middle. Good. So we call this kind of image a memento mori. Does anybody know, what the, anybody ever heard this phrase before? Anybody know what this means? I will take your silence to mean no. All right. Well, let's try and unpack it then. What's a memento? Something to say, like a memory of a certain time, you or something like that. Yeah. You 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 go you go to the beach. You get a shell or something. yeah. You somebody's funeral. You get those little cards or something. You know. Something yeah. Like. Wow. That went dark fast. Yeah. I'm sorry. Like <laughs> from the beach to funeral. Yeah. All right. Yeah. But uh, yeah. So it's yeah. It's a remembrance. Good. What about Mori then? If we don't know Latin, what can we perhaps infer this means? Yeah, similar, you know, morbid, mortician, right? Mortal, yeah, all of these, yeah, they come from the same Latin roots, mors, which means death. So a memento mori is a remembrance of death. And these kinds of images are sprinkled throughout Hamlet. But there's one in particular that I want to focus on um, to start with. Um, so I'm going to show you a brief clip from the graveyard scene. This is filmed in the late 60s. Um, we have here Patrick Stewart again with hair as Horatio and Ian Richardson as Hamlet. Right, remember I said last time that no production of Hamlet that has ever been filmed since the birth of Patrick Stewart can be without Patrick Stewart. I knew him, Horatio. A 
fellow of infinite jest, of most excellent fancy. He hath borne me on his back a thousand times, and now how abhorred in my imagination it is. My gorge rises at it. Here hung those lips, but I have kissed, I know not how oft. Where be your jibes now? Your gambles? Your songs? Your flashes of merriment that were wont to set the table on a roar? Not one now to mock your own grin, but a quiet chap fallen. Get thee to my lady's chamber, and tell her, let her paint an inch thick. To this favor, she must come. Make her laugh at that. I pray thee, Horatio, tell me one thing. What's that, my lord? Dost thou think Alexander looked of this fashion of the earth? Even so, and smelt so. Ha, even so, my lord. To what base uses we may return, Horatio. Why may not imagination trace the noble dust of Alexander till he find it stopping a bunghole? But to consider too curiously, to consider so. Not a face, not a chart, but to follow him thither with modesty enough and likelihood to lead it. As thus, Alexander died, Alexander was buried. Alexander returneth to dust, for dust is earth. Of earth we make loam. And why of that loam, whereto he was converted, might they not stop a beer barrel? Imperious Caesar, dead and turned to clay, might stop a hole to keep the wind away. Oh, that that earth which held the world in awe. My patch of war to expel into us Okay, so a couple of things you want to focus on here. We'll leave this for a moment. Yeah, thank you. First off, we have a return to this discourse of rottenness that we talked about last time, right? Now, what does the rottenness in Denmark come from? What's the source of the rot in Denmark in the play? Or how is it manifesting? Yeah, we've had the murder of the previous king, right? Murder of King Hamlet, and yeah, I think as as your uh, I think as Grace is remembering here, there's the the whole bit about the leprous crust covering over his smooth body, right? That the body of the king, in being poisoned by his brother, right? This poisons the state as well. But there's more to it. Than this. And this is part of what the conversation with the gravedigger reveals, right? So the question that Hamlet asks him, right? How long must a corpse lie in the ground before it is rotten? And what is the gravedigger's response? Something about if he wasn't rotten on earth or something. Yeah. If he wasn't that bad. Yeah. Eight years or so if he wasn't rotten already, right? The point being that most of the corpses he gets to bury, right, are the corpses of people already corrupt. So if we go back to a slightly earlier part of this scene where Hamlet first comes upon the grave, if you look on page 1173, 
Can I get a couple of volunteers here? Can I get a Hamlet, a Horatio, and a clown? All right. Hamlet, Horatio, clown. Go. Start with uh, that skull had a tongue in it. That skull had a tongue in it. Interesting one. How the lady jaws into the ground as it turned came jabbering. That did the first murder, the first murder. Mm -hmm. This might be the fate of a politician, a politician, with this as not overreaches, one that would circumvent. Circumvent. I'm sorry. Yep, it's okay. So, son, 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 son. God <laughs> might it not. It might, my lord. Or a courtier, which could say, Good more sweet, Lord. How does thou sweet Lord? This might be my Lord such a one that praised my Lord such a one horse. When I meant to bear it, might it not? Why, my Lord? Why in so and now my name's one cap chapness and law about the master with a second babe. His fine revolution in and we had the trick to see. Did the bone cough no more the breathing, but to pay a logic with them? My aid to think of um, aunt. A pickaxe and a spade, a spade for a shrouding tree. Oh, a pit of clay for to be made for such, I guess. Okay, throw up another skull. You don't have one? All right, thank you. Hamlet. There's another. Why may not that be the skull of a lawyer? Where be his quiddities now? His quiddities, his cases, his tenors, and his tricks. Why does he suffer this mad life now to mock him about the storms? With, uh, with a day shovel and will not tell him of his action or battery. Hum. This fellow might be in time a great buyer of name with his statue. His statuses, his recognizes, his find, his findings, his double functions, his recoveries. Is this the find of his finds and the recoveries of his recoveries? To have his find paid for a fine dirt. Will his fortune for him no more of his precious and double one too? Then the length and the breadth of a pair of indentures, the very conveniences of his name will start his life. And this box, and must thy inheritor himself has no more heart. Not a job more, my lord. It's not parchment made of sheep skins. Oh, my lord, and no cow skin, too. They are sheep and cows who seek out assurance in that. All right, thank you, all three of you. Well done. Okay, so we've got this rustic fellow standing in a grave, digging up bones, right? And Hamlet is looking at the bones as they're getting tossed up and assigning to them identities, right? Imaginary identities. He doesn't know who these people are, by and large. Um, and what do we notice about these identities that he's assigning to these little bits that used to be people? I've got a politician, a courtier, a lady, a lawyer, and a landowner. What do these have in common? They're not poor people. Okay, not poor people. Yeah, we're, we're talking yeah, about high status people by and large. And there is another thing that these figures have in common with each other, right? How does a politician get people to vote for him? By making Yeah, well, not necessarily false promises, right? Not necessarily lying, but they definitely have to use rhetoric and verbal persuasion to try to make their point, right? And, you know, um, if you haven't yet, please do go out and vote today, right? Very, very important um, that you do 
that. Don't get cynical. Right? I'm cynical enough for all of us. Um, right, so yeah, a politician uses rhetoric to try to get people to see things his way, to try to get people to give him their voices, their votes, right? And what about the courtier he mentions? Who could say, good morrow, sweet lord, how dost thou, sweet lord? This might be my lord such a one that praised my lord such a one's horse when he meant to beg it, might it not? What does a courtier use language to do? Right. To beg, and how they beg through doing what to their hearer? Oh, that's such a wonderful horse. Would that I had a horse like this. Good morrow, sweet lord. How dost thou, sweet lord? Yeah, they're flatterers, right? Yeah. Lady Worms, now chapless and knocked about the mazard with a sexton spade. So, Lady Worm has no jaw. The lawyer and the landowner rely on contracts, right? This is why he's talking about the sheepskins and the calfskins. Contracts and verbal arguments. So, how do most of these figures attain high status? What are they good at manipulating? Yeah, they're good at manipulating language, right? And they use this to gain power and wealth. But we know from the beginning of this bit, right, that skull had a tongue in it and can, could sing once. Right. The bones speak no more. And what has gone with their powers of speech? What's gone away with those? Yeah, they can no longer manipulate language. And as such, does it matter at all anymore what they were in life? Everyone is reduced to the same end. No matter who they were when alive, no matter how clever they were, no matter how many verbal twists and turns they could make, they all end up in the same place. They all end up getting, their, getting knocked about the mazard with a dirty shovel. <clears throat> right, when, the, uh, when Hamlet says, here's fine revolution for you, right, the word revolution Right, what do we usually use this to mean? Wars. Yeah, and what, what, what kind of war is a revolution? Pardon? Like the American Revolution. Yeah, yeah, that would be a, right, an example of a revolution, right? What does a revolution usually aim to do? Yeah, you're trying to overthrow the existing power structure, right? You're going against the existing power structure, kicking it over, right? Literally what the world means, though, is to turn, to, right, to turn, like a wheel. So what he's talking about in these fine revolutions, on the one hand, the literal turning over the bones in the grave, but he's also referring to another one of these uh, common allegorical images. I'm just going to draw this for you. All right, so here we have a woman with a crown turning a wheel. At the top of the wheel, all right, we have a happy king.
As we go down, oh, a crown starts slipping off of his head. Now he is being crushed by the wheel. Anybody know what we call this? This is the wheel of fortune, right? Fortune is the woman turning the wheel. And the king, who has his crown at the top, loses it at the bottom, uh, sort of represents the idea that but for a single turn of the wheel of fortune, right, we could all end up either kings or beggars. Right. Anyone's state can be increased or reduced by a simple twist of fate. So, this is the revolution that Hamlet's talking about here, right? By that one simple turning of the Wheel of Fortune, everyone's reduced to the same status in the grave. Now, we see some hints of this as well when he is conversing with the king about Polonius, right? If we look on page 1154, um, can I get a king and a Hamlet? 1154. All right, king, any to Hamlets? Anybody to be Hamlets? All right, Ayana, be Hamlets. All right, so start with, now Hamlet, where's Polonius? You can just say he when you see ah. Uh. Where he uh, a certain convocation of politic worms are eating at him. Mm -hmm. Your worm is your only emperor for diet. We fat all creatures else to fat us, and we fat ourselves for maggots. Your fat king and your lean beggar is but very close <coughs> surface. Two dishes, but to one table. That's the end. Alas, alas. A man may fish with the worm that hath eaten of a king, and eat of the fish that hath fed of that worm. What dost thou mean by this? Nothing but to show you how a king may go a progress through the guts of a beggar. All right. Thank you very much, both of you. Hold on. All right. So what's the gist of Hamlet's little argument here? Everybody gets eaten by the worms. And a king or a beggar can use a worm that is eaten of a king or a beggar to catch a fish. And then eating that fish is also eating whatever that fish has eaten in the past, right? So a worm can go a progress through the guts of either a king or a beggar, right? A worm that has eat of a king, that has eaten a king, can be digested by a beggar. So all of this worldly status, all of the king's ill-gotten gains, ultimately mean nothing. Everything is ephemeral. Everything dies. Everything passes away. And once it's passed away, it's all the same. Now this actually relates to another common allegorical image, show an example. This one is called the Dance of Death. And we get a look at this here. What do we see? What's going on here? Yeah, we got. Oh, go go ahead. Sorry. Am 
why you can't start this down to my first is the way it's going to order from like a higher class level to the mm -hmm. lower class level. But it's no difference. Like yeah. Yeah, we've got here, we've got like three grain skeletons, right? And who are they leading? Who's this who's first in line here? What does that um, conical headgear tell us about who this is? Think religious hierarchy rather than um, monarchy. Pope? Yeah, exactly. This is a pope. We got the Pope, and following the Pope, we can tell by the rounder crown and the, the worldly orb that he holds. That's a king, yep. And following the king, the wide brimmed hat indicates a merchant. So, whoever you are, however rich you were, however powerful you were, all come to the same end. Right? These kinds of images, these kinds of allegories were all over popular culture in Shakespeare's time. Right? These reminders of mortality and these ideas of death as a kind of leveling force right? that reduces social class difference. I mean, hell, you know, you had, uh, you know, in the, you know, during the years of the Black Plague, right, people just being buried in common graves, you know, just wherever happened to be convenient to put them, whoever they were. So, if we think then about Hamlet's own role in the play, It's related to his musings on his father's jester, Yorick. What does he remember of Yorick? What are his memories of Yorick like? Right, this skull that he's picked up out of the ground, he's meditating on. What does this skull make him remember? Page 1176, right? Alas, poor Yorick, I knew him, Horatio, a fellow of infinite jest, of most excellent fancy. He hath bore me on his back a thousand times, and now how abhorred in my imagination it is. My gorge rises at it. Here hung those lips that I have kissed I know not how oft. Where be your jibes now, your gambols, your songs, your flashes of merriment that were wont to set the table on a roar? Not one now to mock your own grinning? Quite chapfallen? Now get you to my lady's chamber, and tell her, let her paint an inch thick, to this favor she must come. Make her laugh at that. Well, what was Yorick's job? To make people laugh. Yeah, to make people laugh. And the one, he's the king's jester, right? So a lot of Hamlet's memories of this guy are tied up in his crazy pranks and the things he would do right, you know, to set the table on a roar, right, to get people laughing. But the jester had another important function as well. Does anybody know anything about sort of the tradition of the fool and the jester and what the jester was allowed to do that no one else was allowed to do? The jester was the only person who was permitted to always tell the king the absolute unvarnished truth. The jester was the only person permitted to mock the king. So medieval jesters were often also valued advisors because they were the only people who didn't have to kiss the king's ass. Right. The king could not order the jester executed for making fun of him or for telling him something he didn't want to hear. Right. The jester is the truth teller. And if the jester is dead and does not seem to have been replaced, what does this suggest is missing from Claudius's court? The 
truth. Yeah, there's no one telling the truth. And so this is part of the function that Hamlet wittingly or unwittingly fulfills. Right? When he is mocking Polonius, when he is mocking Claudius, when he's mocking Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, right, all of these people who have attached themselves to royal power, is he ever lying to them? I mean, he's, he's pretending to be mad. He's feigning insanity. But he never says anything to them that isn't true, right? Even to, you know, poor unfortunate Ophelia. He never actually says anything to her that's untrue. He just points out that he knows that her father keeps throwing her in his path. So what he is doing is pointing out to other members of the court their own flaws, their own rottenness. Right, so he's exposing corruption in the manner of the fool. He's fulfilling this jester's role. Now, unfortunately, what does this make him unfit for when we get around to the end of the play? Yeah, a good jester can't be a good king. Right? A mocker and an unvarnished truth teller can't be king. So we have to clear the stage of all of the rottenness, right? Hamlet has had to do rotten things as well in the course of his revenge. So in order to clear things out and get a fresh start, everybody has to go. The king has to go. The queen has to go. Laertes has to go. So. I want to show you briefly a clip of the final scene from a more recent production. Do you guys know who David Tennant is? Uh, he was in some of the Harry Potter movies. He's on a couple of TV shows. I mean, he plays Hamlet. Patrick Stewart in this particular production is both Claudius and the dead Hamlet Sr. <coughs> Screensaver. So what I want you to do, right, watch this, and I, I want you to see what mistake are they making at the end of this? What are they cutting from the end of this that completely changes the meaning of the play? Or quit. 
in answer of the third exchange, that all the battlements their ordinance by the king shall drink to have its better breath, and give him a cup, and union shall he throw, richer than that which four successive kings in Denmark's crown have worn. Trumpet speak, trumpet to the cannon, the air without the cannon to the heavens, the heavens to earth. Now the king brings the hamlet, comes again. And you, the judge, bear a wary eye. Follow my mother! 
he is justly served. He that is a poison tempered by himself to strange forgiveness may be what will happen. Mine and my father's death come not upon thee, nor thine on me. A noble heart. Good night, sweet prince. And flights of angels sing thee to thy rest. of having this end here. What's missing? Yeah, they've completely cut out Fortinbras coming in and taking charge, right? There's no new start here. We've got the clean slate, everybody's dead, but we don't have anyone coming in to correct the situation, right? We don't have anyone coming in to take over and make everything all right again. Now, we looked last time at the sort of idea of a kind of triple revenge plot, right? There are essentially three father-son avenging pairs in the play. It's one of the things that makes Hamlet a particularly interesting and complex example of revenge tragedy, right? So we have Our two Hamlets, we have Polonius and Laertes, and Fortinbras one and Fortinbras two. And all three of these revenge plots are supposed to dovetail at the end of the play, right? They're all supposed to come together here. So we have here, okay, yeah, Hamlet 2 is Avenged Hamlet 1. 
everyone who had done his father wrong is dead. Laertes has avenged Polonius. Hamlet's dead. But we don't have Fortinbras coming in to get his own back from the people who took his father's kingdom. So, <clears throat> why does this matter from a sense of dramatic closure? What's the difference between just leaving the stage littered with corpses and having someone come in, take charge, and explain everything? I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Yeah, well, I mean, does it look like there's any way forward at all in... Uh, they ended this way. Not really. I mean, who's who's left? Basically, the only major character left on the stage is Horatio, right? So, the idea of rooting out the cancer in the kingdom, right? Remember, this is in large part Hamlet's goal, right? Curing the poison. If the kingdom is left in chaos at the end, then this hasn't really been accomplished, right? Nothing's really been fixed. But with Fortinbras coming in to restore order, that leaves us in a different situation, right? Now we have a new, better order A clean order with none of these, with none of the stigma of corruption coming in to take over. Now, a couple of other things just to note quickly about this scene. Um, now, the <clears throat> king refers to the pearl he drops into the cup as a union, right? Why might that be important? What other connotations does this word union have that might matter in our reading of this play? Union like government? Yeah, okay, yeah, we could be talking about the union of the state of Denmark, right? Good. What else might it suggest? In fact, he does say that this union is, uh, is richer than that which uh, four successive kings of, in, of Denmark have worn in their crowns, right? So he does link it to the monarchy explicitly. What else does, what else does union mean? Joining together. Yeah, joining together. Who else has been joined together here in perhaps a poisonous way? No, yeah. The marriage of the king and queen, right? The king marrying his dead brother's wife. So yes, we have a poisonous union in the government and a poisonous union in this particular marriage. So this pearl in the cup, which is intended to kill Hamlet, ends up instead killing the king and queen. Right, so for corrupting the institution of marriage and for corrupting the nation's governments, they're poisoned. Right. By a mixture created by the king himself. Right. This guy is a famous and excellent poisoner. Um, now... <clears throat> There are inklings here in the way this is played as well, right? That Hamlet 
frequently knows what's going on. For example, when they're showing them the swords, right? What does Laertes say when he's shown his sword? This one, this one's too heavy, right? But then Hamlet responds, yeah. He's like, wait, they're, yeah, these are all the same. So why is it you want a different one? And the swords are supposed to be blunted, right? So there are hints throughout this that there is treachery afoot. And this is what ruins the perfection of Laertes, you know, avenging his father and sister. Now let's actually talk a little bit about what happens to Ophelia, who seems to be sort of the most, um, the least culpable victim in the play. Do you notice anything particular that she harps on in her madness, right? Her madness is not feigned like Hamlet's. She has actually lost her wits. What do her little songs seem to focus on? Page 1158, right. How should I your true love know from another one? By his cockle hat and staff and his standal shoon. Alas, sweet lady, what imports this song? Say you, nay, pray you mark. He is dead and gone, lady, he is dead and gone. At his head a grass green turf, at his heels a stone. White his shroud the mountain snow, larded all with sweet flowers. Which be wept to the grave did not go with true love showers. So who does she seem to be talking about in her, the early part of her song? He is dead and gone, lady, he is dead and gone. At his head a grass green turf, at his heels a stone. How should I your true love know from another one? Yeah, Hamlet, maybe. But Hamlet's not dead and gone, right? Who's dead and gone in relation to her? <laughs> Whose daughter is she? Yeah, she's Polonius' daughter. So she seems to be kind of conflating father and absent father and absent lover, right? She seems to be sort of mixing Hamlet and Polonius together. in her imagination. Tomorrow is St. Valentine's Day, all in the morning betime, and I am made at your window to be your valentine. Then up he rose and donned his clothes and dupped the chamber door. Let in the maid that out a maid never departed more. By gis and by St. Charity, a lack and fie for shame. Young men will do it if they come to it, by cock they are to blame. Quoth she, before you tumbled me, you promised me to wed. He answers, so would I have done by yonder son, and thou hadst not come to my bed. So what does her song shift to then? What is this little ballad about? It's not about marriage. What's the situation that this little song sets up? Yeah, she's coming, yeah. the lover coming to the young maid's window, right? And then what happens? He promised to marry you. Yep. Quoth she, before you tumbled me, you promised me to wed. He answers, so what he had done by yonder son, and thou hadst not come to my bed. So essentially what he's saying is like, well, yes, I would have married you had you not already given me what I wanted. Right, so he takes the maid's virginity and then disappears. So when we think about this in relation to um, what her father has been using to sort of draw Hamlet out, right? 
How, what was Polonius' theory about Hamlet's madness? Yeah, Polonius believed that Hamlet was so in love with Ophelia that this was why he'd gone nuts, because he'd been denied access to her person. So in order to test this theory, what does Polonius then do? Why does Hamlet tell Ophelia to get thee to a nunnery? Why does he call Polonius a fishmonger? Yeah, it's like, aha, you are trying to, right, Polonius, you are trying to sucker me in with sex, right? You are throwing your daughter in my path, hoping I will do something to prove you right, to prove that you know why I've gone mad. So being pushed back and forth between her father and Hamlet as this kind of, um, sexual football seems to be what breaks her mind, right? And so she's, the two of them together have conspired in destroying her, knowingly or unknowingly. And so this is why her mental illness takes the form that it does. Now what about since this will be important for another play that we're going to be reading a little bit later, Hamlet's good childhood companions, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. What becomes of these two gentlemen? Yes, the ambassador comes to say that Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead. The king's command has been carried out. What was supposed to happen when they all got to England together? Right, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are conveying Hamlet to England with a letter. And what does the letter say? It's not what it originally said. Right, that's what Hamlet alters the letter to say. That the carriers of this letter are to be killed. The original letter says that Hamlet is to be executed immediately. Hamlet is a danger, Hamlet is to be taken care of, Hamlet is to be executed. And Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, his good friends, are going along to deliver the letter and to deliver Hamlet up to justice. So, Hamlet, figuring out what's afoot, tricks these two into going to their own deaths. Now, why do such minor characters need to be disposed of? Why do even Rosencrantz and Guildenstern have to go? Okay, yeah, because they're treacherous. These guys are supposed to be his friends, but they spend the whole time simply doing the king's bidding. But why else do they need, do they need to be cleared out? Maybe if we think about it, the only person connected to the Danish court who survives is Horatio, right? How is Horatio different from other characters in the play? Yeah, he's not involved in any plots, right? He's not involved in any of the intriguing. And what has been established about Horatio from the beginning of the play? Why is Horatio in that first scene with the ghost? 
Yeah, because he's a skeptical scholar, right, who is not prone to wild fancies. He is someone who is eminently trustworthy, who is not going to bend or stretch the truth. And this is why he's left behind to relate the story, right? To tell the audience, well, you know, if this, if Horatio is the last one allowed, alive to tell the story, right, we've already established that Horatio is trustworthy. If there's anyone else alive with the same kind of connection to Hamlet, right, friends of Hamlet's, right, these other friends we've established are not trustworthy and do not have his best interests at heart, and will not, as Hamlet asks Horatio to do, represent his cause aright. So we need to have one character standing at the end of the play who is going to relate the story honestly, truthfully, in an unvarnished manner. Now that everyone else is gone. Everyone else has to go because they're all part of this corrupt infrastructure. Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, insignificant as they are, along with everybody else. And their insignificance is actually going to be really, really important when we look at the Tom Stopper play uh, in, a, um, in a week or so. Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead. Okay, so for next time we're going to be looking um, at something a bit more modern. Um, we're going to be reading uh, A Doll's House by Henry Gibson. And I want you to think um, in particular about one thing as you're reading the play. Right? When this play premiered, it caused riots. Um, they're not Hamlet, uh, A Doll's House. What I want you to think about as you're reading right, is what about this play would have made people in late 19th century Europe so angry. Right? Ibsen received death threats from people over this play. He had to be hustled out of the theater under guard on the night it premiered. So what about this play was so controversial? Right? What about this play would make people so angry? Um, I also have something quickly to return to you.